Good morning, everyone. You ready to go? All right, tell you what, today, I don't know why, but uh, today you have the opportunity of how you're going to receive this message, okay? You can receive it, critical if you want, okay? And some of you might not come back, okay? That's a pretty good way to start this out, isn't it, okay? <laughs> or you can, you can receive it right, and you can receive a great reward from this. It's your choice at this point to open your heart to spiritual truth, amen? amen. All right, let's pray, and we'll get going. Heavenly Father... I, uh, I'm thankful, as always, God, that your word is awesome. Your word is great, God. We are so excited to learn from your word. I pray, God, that these people are as excited to word, learn from your word as I am, God, because I know this, that when I apply biblical principles to my life, God, you want nothing more than to bless me, to reward me, to make my life uh, an incredibly fulfilling journey upon this earth and in the earth to come. And I pray, God, that every single person here would be excited to receive from your word. So, Father, today as I preach, God, I pray, God, that, again, as Paige has already said, that the anointing of God would be upon me. And as I open my lips, God, that it wouldn't be my words, but, God, this would be your truth coming out in order to train these people up for righteousness, I pray, so that you can, uh, can give them, let me say this, so that, God, they can receive the blessings, God, that you have already given to them that's out there that we need to absorb in our life. So, Father, let your will be done this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 What's the LifeHouse about? LifeHouse's mission statement is to maximize the potential of each person's spirit, soul, and body so that you and the people out there can influence the world to live more like Christ. That is what we are about. That's where we get that scripture from right there. And I pray that the more and more we hear God's word, the more and more you're going to become that tool that you're going to be out there influencing the world to live like Christ. Amen? Is that who you want to be, church? That's who we need in this world. We need people out there that are living, living like Christ, teaching people to live like Christ. As we were talking in the family project, this has nothing to do with my sermon even, all right? Okay, we have a world, we have not only a world, but a country that is going to hell. I mean, it, we are declining very, very quickly, all right? You, the body of Christ, has got to be the salt of this world in order to change this world for the better. It ain't going to happen by our government. It isn't going to happen by the secular world. It's going to happen when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, living obedience to God, and changing the world. That's what we're called to do, and I pray that as we preach these messages, you're going to become more and more like that, all right? And that's our goal, that we want to maximize your potential in order to do that, all right? You ready to go? Let's say let's go. Okay. This series we've been looking at is called Full Rewards, all right? We're looking at God desires to give you a full reward. Second John 1, 8. It says, look to yourself, and as I've been saying every single week, and I hope you're taking this to heart, begin looking at yourself. It doesn't begin by you looking at other people, putting judgment upon other people, that we look to ourselves, we examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. And that's the principle that starts your reward right here. You look to yourself. Quit blaming other people. Quit being cruel to other people. But you look at yourself. What do I have to improve on? That we do not lose the things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. The fact is this. God wants to give you a full reward. And not just in the future or, uh, world to come when you go to heaven. But this world, this life right now, he wants to reward you and reward you abundantly. But we've got to learn to live by his principles. As Jim was talking right there earlier, there is principles. There's a spiritual laws that when we live by them... We absorb the rewards that he has already given to us. And what we've looked at in the, the principles of this message is this, that when we choose to honor one another, then we choose to receive a reward. The level that you choose to honor one another is a level of reward that you're going to receive. If you choose not to honor one another, then what you're doing is you're choosing yourself to not live with the blessings of God. It's a spiritual principle. If you don't like it, take it up with God. Don't take it up with me. This is what his word says. 
We see this as we've looked the last couple weeks with the people in Nazareth. Jesus came. He had a full reward to give those people. He could not give them a full reward. Why? Because they didn't honor him. And in the time we live in right now, we are the body of Christ. Every single person here that's part of the body of Christ, that's filled with the Holy Spirit, has a special purpose, a special place, a special anointing within you in order to share with the body of Christ that we can complete the body. And when we go around and saying, I'm not going to honor you, okay, what happens, all right, is we don't receive the anointing that, that Stan has in order to impart with me. So we just limit how much of a reward that we can have. It's all about honoring one another. Now, our roadmap that we've looked at, number one, we looked at entire, uh, honoring the entire body. We looked at, number two, honoring the lesser ones, that when we honor the lesser ones, we will definitely receive a reward is what it says. We looked at in the household that we are to honor our wives, husbands. Honor them, and you will receive a reward. We looked at in our households, we are to honor our children. Last week, we began looking at authority, that we not only honor those below us and uh, the same level as us, but those that are above us. We looked at last week at governing authorities. This week, we're going to look at uh, honoring spiritual authority. And then next week, we're going to close this thing out by looking at how to honor the ultimate authority that is God. Now, as we take a look, as we've taken a look the last couple weeks, God is the one that appoints all authority. It says in Romans 13 to 1, everyone. Last week, we took a look, and I think we identified that you're part of the everyone, aren't you? Is anybody here not an everyone? Okay, okay, so we all agree that you're an everyone, right? Some of you are kind of... Not sure about that. I, if you're alive, your heart's beating, and you got a soul, you're part of the everyone. Nobody wants to say, hey, it's me, because you know this is going to apply to you. <laughs> but this applies to you, everyone. And it doesn't say should submit. It says must submit. That is an imperative command by the word of God that this is what you do. Everyone must submit. What submit mean? Submit means is when you don't agree with somebody, you still honor them. Submitting isn't when you believe and say, yeah, I agree with you. Submitting goes in and you go, Stan, I don't know, man. I, but you know what? Because you're one of my spiritual authorities, okay? I'm going to submit to you. All right? That, that's what submission is. That's why it says, wives, submit to your husbands. They have been appointed in your household to be leaders of your household. Is there times, women, that you don't agree with your husband? It's never happened in my household, I know. But you know what? It says, wives, submit. Because they're the leaders of your household. And again, it's not looking at you to disvalue you. Matter of fact, you're equal to your husband, but it's your role. It's the godly structure that he set in place. So everyone must submit to governing authorities, as we looked last week. For all authority, all, not some, all authority comes from God, and those positions of authority have been placed there by God. So again, last week we looked at governing authorities. The final two authorities that we're going to look at in, this, in these last two sessions of, of, as we look at this principle here is we're going to look at spiritual authorities, how we are called, you're going to see today, to honor, to respect church authority. Okay, and then we're going to look at, again, like I said uh, earlier, we're going to look at how to respect and honor the authority of God. So let's dig into this a second. Matthew 10, four, verse 40 says this. He receives you, and that's the same word as honor or respect. He receives you, receives me, and he receives me or receives him who, oh, I'm sorry, he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Okay, stop right there a second. Okay, this is talking about a spiritual leader, somebody that has spiritual maturity. And it says that if you honor somebody with spiritual maturity, you're not going to receive a righteous man's reward. That comes next. But you're going to receive the, 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 the reward of a prophet. Now, we could take a look at this whole thing, and a prophet, you could really interchange that with the fivefold ministry, so you could say the same thing as he receives an apostle, receives an apostle's reward. You could say he who receives an evangelist, receives an evangelist's reward. He who receives a pastor, receives a pastor's reward. He who receives a teacher, receives a teacher's reward. Okay, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's spiritual authority is what it's talking about. And then it goes on, 
As we've looked before in the last couple weeks, it says he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man receives a righteous man's reward, okay? So that's somebody really on your level, people that are trying to live in righteousness, that you can receive a reward from them. But then it also goes on, as we've looked, and says, and whoever gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, surely I say to you, you will not lose your reward, meaning that we still need to honor those that are below us. When we honor those below us, he says, you're not going to lose a reward. Now, as we look at honoring church leaders, um, I want to define this to begin with. And there are several terms as we take a look at this of what defines a church leader. Number one, as I've already said before, you can look at the fivefold ministry as church leaders. Ephesians 4.11 says, he himself, by the way, remember what I said before, what the Bible says before, that God appoints all authorities? Who's appointing here the fivefold ministry? Jesus. Okay, which, you're right, is God. It says, he himself gave, okay? So he is giving you something here. And by the way, God doesn't give anything bad. He gives good gifts to you. It says, he, gave, he himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers. What for? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for uh, edifying of the body of Christ. The church authority here at Lifehouse Church is here to edify you, to build you up, to protect you. That's what they're there for. Now, some people take a look at this and say, well, some of these authorities, some of the gifts that come out of these authorities no longer exist. They've kind of passed away. And they cite 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I want to show you in a minute here that, no, they do exist. The spiritual authorities that are over top of a church still exist today. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. It says, now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, this kind of repetitive of what it said before. Okay, it's going right down the list here. It says, third teachers, and then it starts lifting some of these giftings that go along with these offices. Uh, the, after that, miracles, gift of healings, helps administration, variety of tongues. And then it gives some questions here. It says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And then he closes this portion and says, but earnestly desire the best gift. And he goes on, he says, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. Okay, so this is where some evangelists, some, or uh, evangel, ev what am I trying to say? What's that? Evangelicals. Evangelicals, there you go. Thank you. It's always good to have. My theologians on the front seat, all right? Evangel Even some evangelicals, okay, would look at this and say, there you go. He taught a better way. And he goes on here, and Paul talks about the greatest gift of this is love. That you love one another. That you love God. By the way, this is the law of Christ. Some people think when Jesus was talking about law, he was taking you back to the old covenant law. He's not. He's talking, now there's sometimes, he maybe was referring to that, but most of the time when Jesus is talking about the law of Christ, he's talking about this, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. It's the greatest gift. It trumps all others. It trumps all other gifts. It trumps all other authorities. When you love, there is no law against love. However, the others that we read before, the apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, they still exist. They're still in play today. And it says here that they are until when. Now take a look at this, 1 Corinthians 13, 8. He goes on here and he says, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. And people go, aha, there it is. There's no more prophecy. So if somebody comes up and says, I got a word of knowledge for this church. You know what? No, you don't. Because they don't exist. Because right here, it says that they fail. Goes on and says, uh, whether there are tongues, they will cease. Okay, so there's no speaking in any type of heavenly language. It says right there, they will cease. Whether there is a knowledge, it will vanish away. So there's no words of knowledge anymore. It says right there. For, for we know in part that when we prophesy in part, but here it is in verse 10. Take a look at this. It says, but when that which is perfect has come, then which is in part will be done away with. So there is going to be a time when these things are done away with. And it says here, they will be done away with. The authorities, these type of gifts will be done away with sometime, but it will be done away with when the perfect one has come. This is 1 Corinthians. This is writing 
after Jesus had ascended, do you agree? This is not talking about the first coming. This is talking about the second coming. Has Jesus returned yet to this earth in bodily form? No. The perfect one has not yet come. Therefore, these gifts are still going. Spiritual authorities, spiritual gifts are still in place. Because listen to me, without Jesus, we need them. We live in a world, we live in a time that is the end times. There, it says in the word, there is going to be great deception in the end times. And we see that all the time. People are being deceived for odd doctrines, falling away from the church and all these kind of things. We need the structure of the church more now than ever. Now when Jesus comes, we're not going to need those things. We're not going to need a word of knowledge when Jesus is here because he's all knowledge. We're not going to have necessarily a heavenly language because Jesus is here. He's going to speak to us. These different gifts that it says will pass away when Jesus is here, there's not going to be a need for them. But you know what? He hasn't come yet. Therefore, we need them in the church today. And we need to honor them. We need to respect them in the church today. So when it talks about the five-fold ministries, we honor the five-fold ministries. Why? Because they are there to equip the church to do the work of the ministry and to edify the body. That's what they're there for you. They're, they're a gift for you if you honor them. Now, the second term that it talks about is more of a general term when it talks about spiritual authority. It talks about elders. Now, we're not necessarily talking about the elders we have at this church, even though they are part of it. Okay, what it's really talking about in general terms is a believers that are mature, believers that are wise, people that you can go to that have a lot of spiritual experience is what it's talking about. Presbyters is really what the name is, but, but it's the people that are, have biblical wisdom to them. Now, the reason why I took this time to define this because you can, again, receive this however you want, this message. Okay, you can disrespect what I'm, me as a teacher right now and say, you know what? He's just here because he's trying to manip manipulate. He's trying to get me to respect him more or whatever. You can take that approach right now, and you can miss everything I'm saying. And believe me, it's, it's a hard message to preach because I don't want anybody to think that. Okay? What I want you to see here is it's not just talking about me as a spiritual authority just because I'm the pastor of Lifehouse Church. There is... A structure at Lifehouse Church that have elders, that have trustees, that have life group leaders. And this is what it's all talking about here. It's talking about everything that's encompassing the five-fold ministry of elders. Of people teaching you, counseling you, all these kind of things. And this is what I still want you to get out of this whole, this whole sermon series. Is It's not about manipulation here. It's about you able to receive a reward. It's not about me getting more respect or something. I appreciate the whole appreciation thing and everything. That's, thank you for, for that. But that's not why I do this. And that's not why I'm preaching this. I'm preaching this because I'm looking at a bunch of people that I care desperately about. And I want every single person here to live a blessed life. And when I look in the Word of God, I see principles in the Word of God that if you live by them, your life is going to be blessed. And I want you to see these things, live by these things, so you can absorb those blessings in your life. So please, when I preach this, understand that we are preaching this message because we want you to be blessed. And that's part of the spiritual principle. And if I didn't preach on this, I'm preaching an incomplete gospel. Because this is part of the principle of honoring and receiving. So let's begin, first of all, with the promise of God upon your life if you honor spiritual authority. You want to turn Psalms 92, verse 13. By the way, uh, this is all on uh, Uversion Live. If you have your iPad or whatever, whatever you choice of tablet you have, you can turn there. It uh, should pop right on uh, if you want to turn there. And... Um, all the scriptures are going to be there, and some other things are on there for your study as well. But if you, uh, you've got the, the old version of the Bible, <laughs> which is right here. By the way, I think everybody should have one of these. Even though you do have a tablet or whatever, it's good to have one of these. Uh, and if, if this is worn out, that means your life is probably pretty good. Okay, if your life is worn out, that means you probably got a pretty nice-looking Bible. Wear these things out. All right? Psalm 92, verse 13, this is what it says. Those who are planted 
in the house of the Lord, and here's your promise, shall flourish. In the courts of our God, they shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. So the reward that you get is going to be that you will flourish. Now, when we look at the word flourish, the word flourish, when you look it up, actually means to break forth as a bud, then all of a sudden, you bloom. It means, it means that you might be in your career at this level right here. Once you plant yourself in the house of the Lord, this is literally in the translation, you will all of a sudden go, and you'll be at the height of your career. It means that you will be abundant, you will abundantly break forth, that you will spring up. And this word fresh here in verse 14 means that you will be rich, that you will be fertile. These are the promises that it says right here. However, there's a condition to it. And this is what I want you guys to see. Because if you guys start to live out the conditions, these things will come upon your life. You believe in the word of God, don't you? Okay. This is the word of God. Look it up in your Bible. I didn't make this up. This is what the Bible says. And if you live by this way, this will happen. Because that's the promise of God. The condition to receiving the promise to flourish starts with this. Those who are planted. Planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. Okay, so in order to flourish, you've got to be planted in the house of the Lord. Let's talk about the house of the Lord a minute. What exactly does that mean? Okay? The house of the Lord is a place that you meet in order that you worship God. Back in the Old Testament when this was written, uh, this is written actually this psalm by uh, Asaph, which was one of David's entourage. And uh, this was before the temple was actually built. This was where they would go to the place where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the, 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 the presence of God was, and they would go and they'd worship. Okay, you know that the Ark of the Covenant moved around. Uh, in the time of Moses, there was the tabernacle. As Joshua took it, that he took that into the promised land. It ended up at Shiloh. All right, it was there for a while. And then uh, through the, the judges period, then at the end of the judges period, there were some wars that took place, and the ark traveled around different places, ended up at Gibeon. Uh, that's where David would go, and he would worship uh, the Lord, and the ark would be there. And it, but it was always in a tent. A big tent, meaning a place that you would go, these people would go, and sometimes they would come, they would, they would remove the top of the tent, and that's where David said, I, I come and I worship God in the, in the shadows of the Almighty. Meaning this, that the ark would be here, as, I don't know, you can see my hand, the shadow, and that those wings would be out, and there's a shadow right there. David would go, and he would get under those shadows of the presence of God, and he would worship God, and the psalmist would, would write down what he was worshiping, and that's how we got psalms. Okay? He would go to a place where God chose to make his name abide, where his presence was. All right? Uh, in our time, in the Christian time that we live in right now, we come to a place, we choose a place that we come to worship God, a place like this, a structure and assembly that we come, that we worship together. So here's the key to unlocking the promise. If you want to flourish, this is a spiritual principle that you can receive. The whole key is this. It's found in the word planted. Okay, the word planted in the house of the Lord does not say those that attend. It doesn't say those that come and visit once in a while. It doesn't say that those people that maybe are on the fence, that maybe they go over here for a while, over here for a while, they dabble in this a little bit, they come over here and dabble in this a bit. But what it says is that these, guys, these people are, are transplanted. That's, that's really what the term is, planted, that it's a tree that's taken up, taken over to a certain ground, transplanted, packed down, begins to root out, that's uh, fixed in place, it's permanent, that nothing will remove it. When the storms of life come, you are there. And believe me, you're going to have a lot of storms in your life. And I want to tell you, church, you're going to have a lot of storms right at this church. The question is this, are you planted when those storms come? When they start to blow and your tree starts to shake, are you planted that you are not going anywhere? That you're embracing all the ground around you in this place? Everything we do, that's what you're doing. Is you're embracing, you're planting, you're planted in the whole ground is what it's talking about here. Now, the house, as it's, we're talking here, what's a house do? A house, by the way, life house is some of the reasons we have this word. A house is somewhere you go for protection. 
When the storms come in your life, you have a place that you're running to that you can go, you can seek wise counsel that's going to protect you from harm. That they're going to be able to look into your life and say, hey, this is going on in your life, man. This is the biblical principle. This is the guidelines that God said. You start to live this way, and your life is going to change the storm that you have right now. It's going to pass. The blessings of God are going to come upon your life. That is what a spiritual house is all about. And those that are planted in a spiritual house that have that covering will flourish. Ten years at Lifehouse. And some of you have been here close to that long. We've seen a multitude of issues come up at Lifehouse Church. Not only corporately, but, but issues in people's lives. And I want to tell you something, first of all. If you want a perfect church, okay, feel free to go find it. <laughs> the fact is, I don't even want to be part of a perfect church. I want to be part of a church that's can be kind of messy. It's not fun sometimes. But you know why church is so messy? Because people's lives are messy. Because we all have a, a hint of selfishness in us, some more than others. And I want to be a place where people, imperfect people, can come and run and say, I need help. Help me, Stan. You're an elder here. This is what's going on in my life, man. And give me some wisdom. And somebody like Stan, Dan, some of our mature believers can say, this is what's going on in your life, Brett. And if you change this, buddy, if you start to do what's in here, let me just show you what's in here, your life is going to change. You're going to absorb the blessings of God, and your life is going to be better. I want to be involved in a church that once in a while has a few messes going on because it shows me that people are coming here with the messes of their life to get better. And here's the deal. At Lifehouse Church, I can assure you we have worked hard to put that structure in place. We have elders that you can run to with family problems, with personal issues. We've got trustees that if you have financial issues, you can, you can run. Look at Mark, man. you got a financial problem, run to Mark, man. He'll sit down and go, okay, let's work out a budget. Let's go Dave Ramsey. He'll write you out one. Okay, so again, you, we, you have a place to go for that. You have a place to go if you have spiritual bondage in your life. We got an amazing group of intercessors here. And I don't even want to name them all as I'm looking at some of them because I don't want to forget any of them. But we've got some people that know how to get the spiritual junk out of your life. We've got teachers. You're confused about doctrine? We've got all kinds of teachers here. Sit down with the teacher. They will set you straight upon what is the truth with the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got life group leaders. You've got fellowship issues, connection issues. Man, we can get you involved in, I mean, I think we've got eight or nine different types of small groups going here at Lifehouse Church in a church of about 225 people. So that's, that's enough for every single person here to get involved. So if you leave this place saying, well, I just couldn't get connected, you know what? It's your fault. We have done everything we possibly can do to allow you to have Christian fellowship. Matter of fact, we've even said, if you don't like one of those groups out there, come talk to me because we would like to help you start one. And then finally, we've got a group of overseers to protect you from me. <laughs> there is overlapping protection, shelter, when you are planted in this place. And I don't want to speak for the spiritual leaders here totally, but I think that they would all say that sometimes it's difficult. Being on the ministry team, isn't it? Have we dealt with a few things, Dan? Stan? Jim? Some looking around at some of our elders. Dan, back there. Trustees would say the same thing. Uh, looking at some of our, our spiritual leaders, our, our prayer leaders and stuff. Sharon, have we dealt with some, some difficult issues? Yeah. It's, it's sometimes, it's a matter of sleepless nights. I, I want you to know, everybody, okay, that your spiritual leaders here just don't listen to you and go home and go, ah, forget about it. At least I, I don't, anyway. We have spent literally, and I'm not trying to have you get the violin out for me or anybody else, but we spend sleepless nights thinking, praying, how can we help these people? 2 Corinthians 11, Paul talks about this. I always love this scripture because it, it relates so much to what we've been through here. He goes in here in 11, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but man, he says, I've been in prison more than anybody. 
said, I've been beaten. I can't even measure how many times I've been beaten for the gospel. That I've been stoned this many times, shipwrecked three times. I've been robbed. I've been starved. I'm cold, wet, naked, weary, and toil. He goes through all these things, and you're going, holy moly, Paul. Glad that's not going on with me. But he said, but you know what? Nothing compares to this. And he closes this thing out with the hardest thing in his life. And he says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight, 28, says, What comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. Essentially saying, you know what? I would rather be beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, all these kind of things. Because it doesn't even compare to how much anguish I go through to help these people. And as you look in your Bibles, all these different epistles that are written in the Bible, it's Paul pouring out his heart to these people saying, you've got to change. You've got to change. You've got to do what the Word of God says. And when you do what the Word of God says and you honor what I'm writing to you, your life is going to change. And he's pouring out his heart to these people. It is so difficult to see the blueprint of God, to counsel people as spiritual leaders, to live by it, knowing that if they can just grab onto it, they would absorb the blessings of their life. And you see people that you care about literally look at you and dishonor your counsel, make bad choices, and you watch them walk down this road knowing that they're going to pay a heavy price for this. Paul said this to the church of Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. He says, dear brothers and sisters, honor, respect, receive. All these words go into this word honor. Honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them not just a little respect, but says, Paul says, no, you show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully with one another. Now, back to the promise that I was just talking about that you can receive, Psalm 92, 13. Those who are planning, again, not those who just attend, who are flip-flopping back and forth and all that kind of stuff, but those people that are planted in the house of the Lord, okay, they shall flourish. And I want you to know, this is a spiritual principle. This is truth. You can take this and put this in the bank because it's the promises of God. If you desire to flourish in your life, if you desire Lifehouse Church to flourish within this community, it begins with you being planted in the house, choosing to honor spiritual authority. And the more you honor spiritual authority, the more you listen to spiritual authority, the more you're going to flourish in your life because that's God's promise. And by the way, you not only will flourish, but you can doubly flourish if you honor spiritual authority. 1 Timothy 5.17 says this, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy, not just of honor, but of double honor. And by the way, when you honor, the level that you honor is the level of reward that you're going to get. If you honor, you respect spiritual authority. And again, please know, I'm not just talking about me. I'm talking about everybody that's over the covering of you in this house, okay? If you honor them doubly, you're going to receive a double reward. I'll show you this in just a minute. So it says, uh, let the elders who rule well be, be, be counted worthy of a double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And then we're going to talk about this in just a second here. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except two or three witnesses. Again, not only does a church leader deserve honor, because they're there to serve you, to protect you, but it says give him double honor. And again, that's a principle that the more you honor the more you're going to receive. And here's the thing that I want you to understand. You have got to protect your honor for your, your elders. You guys are quiet in this place this morning. Either you're really mad at me or you're really spinning in your minds. You've got to protect your honor. You've got to protect, protect your respect for a leader because listen to me when you start to lose respect you start to lose honor for a leader what you're doing is you're losing your reward i had a lady years ago that uh, used to come here to lifehouse church 
And we had a decision that we had to make, and a tough decision about some different things. I won't give you any insight on it, but uh, um, she had a personal agenda with this issue that we're going to deal with. I'll never forget, I remember where I was at when she came to me, and she, she looked at me, and she said, uh, said I want to give you some advice about this whole thing. And she says, I'm going to give you advice as a mother is talking to a son. And in my mind, and I wish I would have said it, I should have stopped her right there and said, you know what? You're not my mother, and I'm not your son. The fact is this, I am the pastor of Lifehouse Church. And if you are here to receive me as a son, which most people look at their son as under them, you're not going to receive much at all. If you choose to receive me as your pastor, your spiritual authority, then that's what you're going to receive. If you receive a pastor, you're going to receive a pastor's reward. If you receive a son, you're going to receive a son's reward, and you're probably not going to receive much at all. And because she didn't honor the spiritual covering, that was just the case, that she couldn't receive anything from me. And by the way, she couldn't receive really anything from Lifehouse Church because she disrespected spiritual authority. And after she began to dishonor the church structure here that we put in place in order to protect the people of this church so that you can flourish, okay, after a while what happened is she left the church. Why? Because she couldn't get anything out of it. And I hate to say this, and I'm inclined to say this anyway, so I'm going to say it anyway. And this is cutting my throat here, maybe. But if you dishonor the authority at Lifehouse Church, you might as well go somewhere else. Because all you're doing is taking up seats. Because you're not going to receive anything. I know people look at me like, I can't believe you just said that. I just said it. My desire here is not for you to take up seats and, and for me just to spew words out and you walk out going, yeah, Whatever. My desire is that you receive, when, when I preach, when somebody else teaches, when a, uh, an elder gives you counsel or whatever, that you walk out with something that you've received that's imparted something in your life that's going to change your life. And if you can't do that around here, my, my goal for you is that go somewhere else that you can. And that's being kingdom-minded. Anyway, this lady, back to the story, she, she left because she didn't get away. And, and here's what happens when people leave when they don't respect authority. Is they, most people just don't leave and just leave quietly. They have their little friends. And she went and she began making one-sided accusations, dishonoring the authority at Lifehouse Church. And guess what? Other people took up the offense of this person. One-sided defense of this person, and guess what that happened, what, what they did? They lost honor for the authority at Lifehouse Church, and pretty soon they had to leave too because they weren't receiving anything. Let me just tell you something. Somebody comes up to you with accusations against an elder. And I'm not just talking about our elder. I'm talking about somebody in spiritual maturity, whether it be your life group leader, teacher, whatever it is. Somebody comes up to you and starts to talk to you and say, hey, I've got a juicy one to tell about Pastor Brett. You know what? You know what this person's doing if you receive it? He's actually taking a reward from you. And you better think really clear and hard when somebody comes up to you and says, I've got a juicy one to tell about so-and-so. You've got to protect your honor for leaders because if you lose it, you're not going to receive. Okay, now this brings up this last part in 1 Timothy 5.19. It says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except for two or three witnesses. Now, here's a warning that I want to give to everybody, what I just said. If you want to receive from Lifehouse Church, and by the way, another little bunny trail, if you don't learn this principle here, and you think, well, I'm just going to go somewhere else, you're going to take that same principle the next church you go, and the same thing's going to happen to you. You might as well learn your, your lessons while you're here because it's not like somewhere else is going to change you. And if you can't respect and honor authority right now, you're not going to do it the next place you go. Yeah, you might have a honeymoon period that you go, hey, he's a great pastor for about the first year. After that, you're going to start seeing a little flaws. You know what? I, I put my pants on the same way you guys do. I got issues going on too. 
And sooner or later, you're going to see a chink in my armor once in a while. And if you're not able to submit to authority, okay, you're going to start going, well, he's winning, you know, and, and you're not going to receive. But it's going to be the same way wherever you go. So you might as well figure it out right now. But when people choose to dishonor authority, here's what happens, okay? James 4 talks about this. It says, if you don't get what you, if they don't get what they want, what they do, and I'm not reading this verbatim. This is kind of my translation. It says, they scheme and they fight to take it away. And that's actually what James 4 says. They scheme and they fight to take it away if they don't get what they want. Now, here's the normal scheme that people do when they don't get their way because they don't see the big picture of what's going on here. And by the way, you've got to know that there is a big picture here. And even though you've got your life, and I don't want to be condescending on your life because your life is very important to me. But there is other lives involved in this whole place. And when we've got to make decisions around here, we can't just look at you and say, we're just making this for you. Because we've got to look at the big picture. But when people come, they don't get what they want. What they do is they scheme, they fight in order to take it away. And here's what they do. People make accusations against a leader, and here's what they do. They go out and they look for a listening ear. Who can I tell this to? And I want you to know, if you give ear to one-sided accusations, whether you want it or not, what it does, it's going to plant some sort of doubt in your mind towards that leader. It just will. And what happens when there's doubt that enters your mind, the next time that elder, that spiritual leader comes to impart something in you, to teach you, to counsel you or something like that, you're not going to receive a reward from him. You're not going to be able to see, receive that, that gift or what, that, that reward that he has to, to give to you from God. So again, you've got to protect the honor towards elders. And when you protect your honor towards elders, it will directly protect the reward that God has for you. So here's the deal. This is your application here. Next time somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I've got something to tell you about this person or whatever, here's my admonish to you. You look at that person and say, stop. I don't want to hear it. I rebuke you, and I rebuke that thought. Matter of fact, I was with uh, uh, one of our overseers, David Zock, the other day. And uh, I don't know if you know him or not, but I was having lunch with him. He said, yeah, I've had people come up to me and try to tell me about what's, what happened at Lifehouse, blah, blah, blah. And, and that's what he said. He said, you know what? I look at those people and I say, stop. I know that church, and I know that they would never do anything uh, to be against anybody at that church. And I don't even want to hear it. And that's what we need to do. People come up to you with a one-sided accusation towards one of our leaders here. You need to look and say, stop. I rebuke that thought, and I rebuke you. And here's what I want you to do, person of accusation. Let's turn with Matthew 18 for just a minute. And you turn to Matthew 18 with them, and this is what Matthew 18 says. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. And if other persons listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. So what you need to do the next time somebody says, I've got an accusation towards you or towards somebody, is you go, Dan, come here. We're going. Let's go talk to him. And you pull that person and go, let's go to Brett's office right now. And you don't know normally what that person will do? No, 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 no. That, that's fine. No, we're going right now. If you've got an issue with Brett, you've got an issue with Stan, you've got an issue with Dan, you've got an issue with whoever, we are going right now to take care of it. And if you don't want to take care of it, then shut up. Because I don't want to lose honor for them, and I don't want anybody else to lose honor for them. So let's go take care of it. And then it goes on here. And this dovetails so well with what we just read in 1 Timothy 5. It says, you have, you have one for, verse 16, but if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Remember in 1 Timothy 5 it said the same thing? Don't believe accusations unless there's two or three witnesses. This is how it works. You follow the Matthew 18 process to the T. And if the person still refuses, take him Take your case before the church, which in this case, you would take them before the whole, whole elder board. The only time you believe in accusation, honestly, about anybody, it's not even just talking about spiritual authority here, with anybody. The only time you need to believe in accusation and receive an accusation is after you follow the Matthew 18 process where two or three witnesses agree with you. Now, let me just talk real quick about witnesses, and we'll be done here in just a minute. Witness is not defined as an emotional person that you go to because they're your buddy 
and I'm upset, so I'm going to go to my buddy because he's going to take my offense on. That is not what a witness talks about. What a witness is talking about here is, and you can look it up yourself, it means it's an analytical, legal term. The witness means that somebody that would have the evidence, biblical facts, that would hold up in a court of law that that person is wrong. That it's somebody that has looked over the, the big picture of it, the whole picture, not just your side, not just their side, not this neutral side, but looked over the big picture, looked in the Bible and says, okay, this is a problem. And not just one of them, but two or three need to come together and say, yeah, that person's wrong. And if you come to that conclusion, and the elder, your spiritual leader, overseer, is wrong, and he doesn't repent, at that time, then you remove yourself from his leadership or her leadership. And if the elder's found to be an error, unrepented, and you choose to remove yourself, here's another thing. You still do it quietly. You still do it with honor because you know what? God still has appointed them. Now, that's a lot of the negative side. Let me close with focusing more on the positive side. Okay, can you guys breathe again? The positive side is this, that if you show honor, you can receive a double reward from God. 2 Kings verse two, uh, or chapter 2 talks about Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was going to be taken from God. Um, everybody knew it. Everybody knew something was going to happen to Elijah. They didn't know if he was going to die of a, you know, a heart attack or, or whatever. They, they didn't know that he was going to be taken by a chariot. They just knew that he was going to be taken. And even though he was going to be taken, Elisha, the person that was under his authority, said, I'm not going to leave you. I will never leave you until the day that you die. And it's kind of an interesting story, and I'm kind of reading up a little bit here. But 2 Kings verse two, or chapter 2, verse 5. And this happened two other times before this, where people came to Elisha and said, you know he's leaving? And Elisha kept looking, going, duh, I know he's going. You guys know he's going. I know he's going. But this is the account right here. It says, a group of prophets from Jericho came to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? And he says, of course I know, Elisha answered. And he says, be quiet about it. Essentially what he's saying is, you think I'm stupid? He is my master. I know he's going, so why don't you shut up because I'm kind of sad about it. Because people kept heckling about this, and he didn't want Elijah to go. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to the Jordan River. But again, Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you, live your, and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together. That is honor right there. When somebody looks and says, you know what, I don't care what happens in your life, I don't care the storms in your life, I will never leave you. And he showed him not just honor, but I believe he was showing him double honor. Why? Because the next verse, 2 Kings, a couple verses later, 2 Kings 2, verse 9, it says, when they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. And Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double portion or a double share of your spirit and become your successor. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied, and if you see me when I'm taken from you, then you'll get that request. This is all about honor and, re honor and rewards. He honored him. He said, I am never going to leave you. I'm planted with you. And because of that, he received a double portion of Elijah's impartation. Biblical account shows that when you honor a leader, you have the opportunity to receive double reward, and this is why. In John 13, 20, Jesus addressing his disciples that later became the spiritual leaders of the church, and this is what he said. He said, most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. Talking about spiritual authority. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. Same pattern Today, 2,000 years later, is when he said that. If you honor the church leaders that he put in place, you're not just receiving me. You're not just receiving the elders. You're not just receiving the trustees. You're not just receiving the prayer team. You're receiving Jesus. And when you receive Jesus, he will reward you. In closing, after 10 years of pastoring Lifehouse Church now, and my hair starting to turn white, I passed the gray stage a long time ago. People, and I've been asked this lately, 
I don't know why, uh, but asked me lately, you still, you still on the fire to pastor this church? I mean, do you still really get up in the morning and, and live and breathe pastoring Lifehouse Church? And I can give you the spiritual answer, the leadership answer, and say, yes, I get up every day and I just can't wait. I can say that. But I live in a glass house, and let me be transparent with you. And maybe this is an unspiritual answer, more of a humanistic answer, but I think most leaders would agree, and I think some of our elders would agree once in a while as well. But I'm asked that it depends on how many arrows I have sticking out of me from the day before. And that's just an honest answer. Listen, at least in Hastings, Nebraska, I, I don't think anybody does, does this for fame and fortune. If you want fame and fortune to be in the ministry, move to L.A., get on a TV show. I don't do this, and again, I appreciated the appreciation that you guys showed me, but I don't do this for pats on the back or anything. I get invited every year to pastor appreciation banquets. There's two or three of them, and maybe it's wrong. I just don't go. Say, so, yeah, thank you, but I just, it's just weird for me to have people clap for me because it's my calling. It's just something I do. And every day I get up and say, God, you want me to do this? And he always slaps me on the rear and says, get out there, you're fine, go do it. See, when a leader's beat down, burned out, of course you get tentative in what you're doing. You guys do the same thing in your job. When you feel that emotional energy being drained out of you. Remember when Jesus was touched by the woman with the issue of blood? He said, who touched me? I feel the energy that just left me. You can literally feel it drain out of you sometimes. And when you feel burned out, beaten down, that kind of thing, I want to tell you, it's hard sometimes to say, I can't wait to go go do this. But let me tell you the other side of the coin. The thing that puts fuel in the tank of ministry leaders is when somebody like Elisha comes alongside of you and says, you know what, I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to defend you. Even though no arrows are flying all over the place, I am not going to leave you. Elijah when people say that and say I am planted here and I don't care what storms it brings I am here with you that puts fire that that lights the rockets once again and here's what it does folks and again I'm just not speaking for myself but I think any spiritual leader in this church and everywhere else would, would say the same thing when you commit to honoring and respecting a leader even though we don't we don't most leaders don't go out for that but listen, when you feel it, when you feel that respect, it reignites a desire into our spirits to pour our lives out into you so that you can receive more reward. If you want your spiritual leaders to serve in a greater capacity within the church, then you honor, you respect them, and they will have the fire within their bones to reach out and to make your life as good as they possibly can. The word says, honor a prophet, receive a prophet's reward. Honor a righteous man, receive a righteous man's reward. Honor a little one, and you shall not lose your reward. We are called as a spiritual principle to honor one another, and when we do, God is going to reward you. That's what this is all about. And again, you can take this message the wrong way and you can say, he's trying to get me to like him more. I've told you, if you don't like me, go somewhere else. It's a kingdom thing. If you want a reward, that's what this whole message is about. This whole series is about. If you want a reward, begin to honor one another and God is going to reward you. Anybody want to flourish in this place? I just gave you the key for it. Plant yourself here and see that God will make you flourish. Amen. Stand up and pray. Hallelujah. <sighs> Heavenly Father, I feel I've preached today what you've asked me to preach. And I just pray, God, that the people here, God, would receive, receive a pastor's reward. I pray, God, that you would deal with hearts here. I know, God, in this country, it's so hard for people to respect authority because we're taught just the opposite. We're taught we're the same. 
but God, you have appointed and anointed your spiritual leaders for such a time as this. I pray, God, people would fall under that covering, God, that they would be protected under that covering, God, so you can flourish their lives. Bless these people, God, as they live out your promises or your, your patterns and receive your promises. You are an awesome God. You have nothing but the best in mind for your people. Thank you for your blueprint. Help us to, to live by it day by day. In Jesus' name.